Well, I think Christ for the City is one of a very creative mission. It respects the gifts of each member around a common theme of how do we serve Christ in the cities of the world in, in uh, connection with, supported by, and supporting the local churches. We're not off doing our own thing without reference to the total body of Christ, but we're seeing how we can serve both the church and the community, uh, showing compassion and trying to be needs in the name of Christ. And I think we have incredibly gifted people and excellent leadership, and um, I really think that um, we're going to have a great future. We're going to continue to grow. Well, I think obviously the short-term teams, if they are well planned and well done, and ours are, can lead to a significant paradigm shift. People get out of their own little cultural uh, context and begin to experience the world and its needs in places that are very different and also see how the gospel is relevant to meeting those needs and how people are sometimes with great sacrifice and very hard situations are being, beginning to meet needs in the name of Christ. It enlarges their understanding of the Christian life, and I think enlarges their understanding of the world. Well, the context of mission has changed um, with uh, the relationship with China and the coming down of the Ber Ber Berlin Wall in 89, and uh, new technology, new ways of communicating and travel. That has changed the context of mission. Um, Secondly, the missionary movement is now more multi-denominational, multi-national, um, multi-ethnic. So probably three to four times as many non-Western missionaries at work in the world as, as uh, Western missionaries. Um, uh, the whole issue of immigration and globalization. So Storm Lake, Iowa, for example, 37 languages spoken in a town of 13,000. So that now mission is from everywhere to everywhere, and we don't think of mission in terms of geography. When we went, you were foreign missionary. You went to another country. We don't talk about that anymore. We talk about cross-cultural missionary, and the, another culture might be right across the street. So that whole context of mission, we have at least 200 million immigrants in the world today, people living in countries where they were not born, and that's only going to increase. Um, so the whole context of mission, uh, has changed in terms of where people are, the reached and the unreached, and all these different issues. A um, friend of mine who had been a missionary in Guatemala said, if you want to reach one certain people group in Guatemala, you go to a certain area in northern Guatemala, or you go to a certain barrio in East L.A., because hmm. they're back and forth. But, of course, after they've been in East L.A. for a while, their culture's change. Sure. So. Culture's constantly changing. The whole postmodern idea the secularization of the West, um, which brings some disadvantages but also some advantages because um, in my generation we considered ourselves a Christian culture and a lot of people sort of went to the church because it was a good thing to do and part of the culture. That's no longer the case. Mm. So maybe that leads us to ask what does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ today? Mm. There are a lot of different things. Going on. Yeah. Well, I think the creativity of the Holy Spirit, virtually always throughout the history of the church, arises on the periphery. Um, you look at the book of Acts. It's Philip, not the apostles, who go to the Ethiopian and to the Samaritans. Cross-cultural mission begins in Antioch, not Jerusalem. You can see that theme all through history. What this says is that we respect the creativity of the Holy Spirit through unexpected people in unexpected places. Now, we also need that relationship with the center and there's kind of a symbiotic relationship between the periphery and the center. Um, so the church today needs to encourage the creativity of the younger generation. They will think of things, ways of doing things that I would never think of in my generation. On the other hand, sometimes there's the wisdom of, the, of history that, that can help young people not go off in, in directions that are not productive. So we need that relationship between the periphery and the center, between the youth and their creativity and the older generation with their experience. But you look at movements, how many great technical achievements have started in garages? Hewlett Packard, Steve Jobs started in a garage. You take something like 
YWAM, OM, many other mission organizations that start among very young people. See? So we want to encourage that in our youth. But the youth have something to learn from experience. And if you think about the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and the Jesuits, three greatest orders of the Roman Catholic Church, Ignatius Loyola was a layman when he started the Jesuits. Francis was a layman when he started the Franciscans. Dominic was a priest, but he was a priest from Spain who came into France. And it was after they started their movement that the Vatican, that the Pope recognized them. None of them were initiated by the papacy or Mother Teresa. Same deal. She starts her movement, then it gets recognized by the Senate. So we see that all through history. Mm -hmm. um, William Carey had to try three times before the Baptist Church would ordain him. He's a member of a small Baptist group. He's a cobbler, school teacher, self-taught. There's where the Western Missionary Movement begins. A um, friend of mine who's now deceased, worked in Ethiopia, and he said, the, it, the gospel's almost out of control in a lot of places. It's growing so fast. And it comes as incredible good news, if we understand it correctly, to people who've been oppressed. Um, women, uh, the poor. Think about the radical nature of the gospel. It says, you're created to be, you're created in the image of God. You're called to be a son and daughter of God through Jesus Christ. That's your status. Your society may say you're nobody. The gospel says you're somebody under God. We have an incredible message to share. And uh, I think that the church is exploding in growth in many parts of the world today as never before. This is the greatest period in the history of the missionary movement, 2,000 years. Now the patterns will be different very often, and we need to discover the new patterns. But when I went to Brazil in 56, the perception was the missionary movement was almost over. Hmm. You know, you had the whole communist bloc closed, you had colonialism ended, and many countries were expelling missionaries, and it didn't leave much of the world open to, to uh, Christian mission. Today, of course, the whole world is open with almost no exceptions, mm. and the churches are growing. Are you surprised by anything, or, or have you been taught not to be surprised? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I always tell my students that history is, teaches us to look for the surprises of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit constantly surprises people all through history. And so while we are surprised, we should expect to be surprised. Kind of look forward and relish yeah, that. And yeah, yeah. And, and the worst thing we can think of is we can ever say or think is that it'll never work because we never did it that way before. You know, history is full of surprises. Good. The, the evangelical movement and the missionary movement basically come out of four... Uh, historic movements, Puritanism, which was an attempt to take the English, the Anglican Reformation in a more Calvinistic direction, it got persecuted, and then the uh, Pietist movement, which started again on the periphery with Spainer and Franca in Germany, and sent the first European missionaries to Asia in 1706, and then the Moravian movement, which is a little movement that has tremendous impact and then the evangelical revivals in England and North America, led by Wesley and Whitfield and Edwards and others. All of those movements started on the periphery of the larger structural churches, had great influence on those churches, and the missionary movement arose out of those movements. Um, the uh, revival in 1858 in the United States was led largely by laymen, again gave birth to another surge of mission and the student volunteer movement in 1886, which basically is a lay-led movement. You know, the leaders at the student volunteer movement convention were D.L. Moody and Wishard, a YMCA secretary, and Wilder and Mott. They were all laymen. Hmm. There was one Presbyterian minister in leadership. His name was A.T. Pearson. No relation. <laughs> but it was a lay-led movement. See? Hmm. And it came out of the, the background with the 1858 revivals. Good. All right.